Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord today. The Bible tells us to the Lord's Day, let us be glad and rejoice in it. And so good to be here, good to see some individuals I haven't been able to see so a while for due to sickness. Good to see you all out. And it's good to be here today at Victory Baptist Church. And if you're a guest with us, we're honored to have you today. And inside of our bulletin, there is a little tearaway. If you wouldn't mind just to fill that out for us, let us know about your visit. And also, uh, keep this in mind as well, we're serious about prayer here, and we pray uh, for all those that are requesting prayer. And inside the bulletin, you'll see a place to fill out a specific prayer request that you have, and you can give that to me, you can give that to Lisa, you can give that to someone to pass along to us, and we promise you that we will pray for your needs. So something just to keep in mind. A couple of things just to pass along to you this morning for you can be aware of. Uh, remember, the church office uh, will be closed tomorrow for Labor Day, a observance of that. Also, we're needing volunteers to help cook for Family Promise on September the 17th, 18th, and 19th. There is a sign-up sheet there in the foyer, and meals should be uh, for a family of four, two adults, and two children. And the children's ages are between eight um, uh, and two, so uh, keep all those um in mind. Also, something else that's coming back, and I'm excited about it. Um, unfortunately, I, I sometimes I, I feel like I'm torn because I, I really want to be over here doing the Bible study, but also I love being over at the uh, uh, our family life building, our, our gym over there, to hang out with the kids on Wednesday night. And so this Wednesday night will be the kickoff of Victory Kids, our ministry for the children, and we are in need of some help. And if you want to help in this, uh, you can see Charlie and also see uh, Lisa as well. And uh, we have uh, several people in different positions, but we can always need more help because there's a lot of kids that come out on Wednesday nights, and we want to continue loving on them and letting them know how much we care because it's important for us to teach them the truth about Jesus. And so um, keep this in mind. If you'd like to help, we would love to have your help and participation um, in that. Also, our Operation Christmas shoe box, you see there in the bulletin, uh, the $300, $380 that has been raised so far, and the packing goal is $4,000 for shipping boxes, so continue to give towards that. And then another event that is next Sunday, we're already here, we're in September, and it's going to be Church in the Park. Uh, that is going to be next Sunday, a great event, September the 10th at 5 p.m., and um, the service is going to start at 6.30, and we're going to start cooking at 4, but we need help. And right after the service today, we're going to be having a very short meeting, hopefully. Um, if you are interested in helping and you haven't let us know, uh, we'd like to get you signed up to help in some way. Last year, we had an awesome, awesome event, great turnout from the community, but we are looking forward to just another uh, just wonderful time in the Lord that night to be able to minister to um, the Kingston area. So uh, please, please stay after the service if you want to help because we'd love for you to have that opportunity to participate. So remember that right after the service. Also, uh, right after the service this morning, we are going to be voting real quickly. Uh, right, after, It won't take long at all, but we're going to be voting on Mark and Naomi Bowers as one of our new missionary couples that we are going to support so that'll be as soon as the service concludes today. Uh, Brother Mark and uh, Naomi were here uh, last Sunday to share, and they shared about their heart of where they're going to serve out there in Germany. So we're looking forward to supporting them, and we're going to be voting as soon as the service is over um, to take them and accept them on as our missionaries that we do support. And with this being the first Sunday in September, we have two new missionaries we're going to be recognizing each Sunday this month. Uh, we have the Housers, which are in the Philippines. And then also we have the Davis family, which is, they are located in Utah. So these are our missionaries of the month that we are praying for, and we're getting in there in front of you. And uh, I know it's a little awkward this morning. I'm looking at the screen. I'm thinking something is missing. <laughs> it's just missing up there. And I'm thinking, what is it? The screen's up there. But we're working on getting some improvements made. We have a new camera. Uh, thankful for... Uh, Brother Stephen, for all that he does, and uh, we're doing some adjustments there, so that'll be back up, and I'm thinking, like, something's missing. You know, something when you think 
it's like gone, and you're like, whoa, something is totally different here. But, uh, but we are thankful for him, and uh, we'll be having that back up here soon. Well, it's good to be here today. I uh, don't uh, forget as well our offering to my left, and as you leave this morning, give the Lord tithes and offerings, so keep that in mind as well. But let's go ahead and let's start with a time of prayer, and let's just ask the Lord just to have his way in the service, and let's just sing praises unto him, and let's honor him with our voices and worship him, and let's just expect him to do something amazing today in our service. So let's go ahead and let's pray, and we'll ask all these things. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this time to be here today. It's such a privilege just to be able to come together corporately and worship your holy name. And Father, I pray as the choir sings, I pray they lift praises unto you. You are worthy. And for me, in a short while, use me as your messenger. Father, today, for those that need to make a decision for whatever it might be, I pray for them. We love you so much. And we ask all this in the wonderful name, the name above every name, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. And we're looking forward to him when he comes for us. Amen. Amen. Good morning. If you will, go ahead and stand. Y'all have screens to look at, so forgive me if I'm not looking at you. In your hymnal on page 519, we're going to be singing Love Lifted Me. 519. Yeah. 
you want to find that image. Yeah. If you want her, go ahead and come on up. been on my way to heaven for a long, long time. Many things have happened to cloud it up my mind. But I am more determined to walk the narrow road. I've got more to go to heaven for than I had yesterday. There's a golden street to walk upon, a bell I'm gonna ring. Brand new members in the choir, I wanna hear them sing. 
There'll be a lot of friends and loved ones when I walk through the gate. I've got more to go to heaven for than I had yesterday. Well, I've been in the lonesome valley. I've climbed the highest hill. I've known the joy of living in the center of God's will. I've watched the angels come and take my loved ones home to stay. I've got more to go to heaven for than I had yesterday. There's a golden street to walk upon, a bell I'm gonna ring. Brand new members in the choir, I want to hear them sing. Be a lot of friends and loved ones when I walk through the gate. I've got more to go to heaven for than I had yesterday. Yes, I've got more to go to heaven for than I had yesterday. Amen. Thank you for all that wonderful singing from the youth and also from Miss Peggy and I. Think about that uh, that first song there by the youth. I was thinking about our joy and how that uh, Satan tries so often to rob us of our joy and to take it away. But when we think about how wonderful and how good and how awesome that our God is and how much He loved us, how that we have victory, like the old song says, victory in Jesus. We can sing, and it keeps Satan from taking our joy. And then that song about heaven, we know how wonderful heaven is from the description we know in Scripture, but it's going to be a wonderful place one day for us to behold. And we know from the Bible that we have a place that's been prepared for us, all because a sweet, wonderful King Jesus. And so thankful for that. If you turn with me this morning, Nehemiah chapter 2, look at verses 17 through 20. And if you would stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word. I've always loved the book of Nehemiah. So much that we can learn from that on a practical sense, but also spiritually as well. Starting here in verse number 17. Then said I unto them, Ye see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build, so they strengthened their hands for this good work. But when Sanballat and Horonite and Tobiah, the servants, the Ammonite and Geshem, the Arabian, heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, What is this thing that ye do? Will ye rebel against the king? Then answered I them and said unto them, The God of heaven, He will prosper us. Therefore we His servants will arise and build, but ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank You for this privilege to be here this morning. Help me today, Father, to speak Your truth. Help me today to say what needs to be heard. We thank you for the reading of your word. Thank you for all you do. 
Thank you for Jesus because it is only through the precious blood of the Lamb that we can have salvation. And we ask all these things in His name. Amen. You may be seated. Nehemiah is an interesting story in the Bible like I mentioned here briefly a few moments ago. Nehemiah is one of my favorite stories in the Bible when you look at it. It's a very interesting one. Uh, Nehemiah was a layman, uh, a cupbearer to the great Artaxerxes Longamenus, who ruled Persia from 464 to about 423 B.C. Uh, he is identified as the son of Hakaliah to distinguish him from the other Jews of the same name. Now, Nehemiah means literally, the Lord has comforted. Now, we see here in the very first part of this book, chapter 1, chapter number 2, that we find the story, Nehemiah is a cupbearer, and uh, he's much more than our modern butler that you could think about today. Uh, it was a great portion or a position of great responsibility and privilege to be in this position as being the cup bearer. Um, at each meal, this is interesting to know, at each meal that the king had, he tested the king's wine to make for certain that it wasn't poisoned. Now, you could take that one way or another. Now, if it's poisoned, he's in trouble. But uh, if he had to test that, so he had this important responsibility to make for certain that the king was okay. Uh, this man was someone that was very close. He was among those that was in royalty. He was to stand in public, so he had to be a very handsome individual. They didn't want some just shabby individual being there to represent the kingdom. So he had to look really handsome, cultured, and also he was very knowledgeable in court policy. So Nehemiah had to be a very smart intellect. He had to be someone that knew a lot. And he was also able to converse with the king and also to advise him. So Nehemiah had a great position that was here. A lot of responsibility that was upon his shoulders. And because he had access to the king, this is Nehemiah, the cupbearer was a man of great influence which he could have and use for either good or evil. Okay, well that's a lot that's being said here about Nehemiah. But the big question that we have to ask ourselves is that the Jews, this story here, we find out from the book of Nehemiah, and we also know from the book of Ezra as well, that Jerusalem lie in waste because of their idolatry, because of their wickedness, Jerusalem had pretty much been destroyed. It had lied in waste and we know that Ezra had come and had done some work on the inside but we know here from the book of Nehemiah that we find out that the wall is pretty much destroyed and something has to happen. But the question that is important is why would Nehemiah, why would he inquire about a struggling remnant of people who lived hundreds of miles away? Well, that's a good question. Why would he want to do that? Well, after all, he was the king's cup bearer. He had it made. He had everything that he could imagine. He was successfully secure in his own life. Certainly, it wasn't his fault it wasn't Nehemiah's fault at all that his ancestors had sinned against the Lord and brought judgment to the Jerusalem and to the kingdom of Judah. That wasn't Nehemiah's fault. So once again, I ask the question, why would he want to get involved in this big mess? Well, certainly a half century before, Jeremiah had given these words from the Lord. And it says this, For who shall have pity upon thee, O Jerusalem? Who shall have pity that you're in this predicament? Who shall have pity upon you because of the decisions that you have made? Or who shall bemoan thee? Or who shall go aside to ask how thou doest? Guess who that individual is? Nehemiah. Now as we look at the book of Nehemiah here at the beginning, 
we know that Nehemiah finds out about what's going on and he has to go before the king to ask permission to go and to see what needs to be done. So here he goes before the king and the king has a high level of respect for Nehemiah and he says to Nehemiah, Nehemiah, why are you so sad? Why do you have such a sad countenance about yourself? And he speaks and he tells them about what's going on in Judah. And he says, would you please send me so I can find out what needs to be done. So here we find out that Nehemiah goes. And what does he first do? Well, like any good person does, if there's something wrong with something, you got to inspect it first to see what's wrong. So we find out here in chapter number 2 that Nehemiah inspects the walls. And I believe as he started to travel and as he came there to inspect the walls, I believe his heart was torn. I believe he had this sad countenance about himself to see that his people were in the state that they were. But the book of Nehemiah as we're going to find out this morning, is about the overseeing of how he was going to lead the the people to rebuild it. The walls around Jerusalem. And when you think about the book of Nehemiah, it's a book about work. And I know we get work off tomorrow, it's Labor Day. But as we think about Labor Day weekend, why was that given? It was in honor of those who work in the workforce. But some forms of the word work, labor, build, or repair occur over 80 different times in these short 13 chapters that we find here in the book of Nehemiah. But Nehemiah had a task that was before him. As he journeyed there, he must be thinking to himself, he knows he's led of God, but as he goes, he's thinking... How in the world am I going to motivate these people to rebuild this wall? How am I going to do it? See, Nehemiah's success depended on how well he organized and motivated workers to join him in building the wall. See, Nehemiah was going and God was going to use him, but he couldn't do it by himself. No one could. That's why he had to go, he had to train, and he had to equip them, motivate them to help rebuild the wall there for Jerusalem. Now, in chapter number 3, that's an important chapter because 50 names and families are mentioned in Nehemiah chapter number 3. It is more than a list of names. It is a register of workers. And these were individuals that Nehemiah had to pour into to get this wall back to where it should be. Now, management. We think about this from time to time. What is management? When management is divided into two categories... Management of things, one. And number two is a management of people. So you have management of things and of people. Now of the two, which is the most difficult to manage? Well, people. People are the hardest to manage, but also not only are they hardest to manage, but they're the most important to manage. That's key. That's very important. Because from people come ideas. And as Nehemiah made this journey, he knew how important it was for himself to encourage these people to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. He knew how important that was. And the most valuable resource of any organization, of any church is the people that serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's important, okay? Now, we're going to talk about Nehemiah's recipe. I'm not talking about what he was cooking. He might have liked some good stuff back then. I don't know what he ate. 
But Nehemiah's recipe for success. How did he make this happen? How did it work? Well, I think there's five things that are important as we look at this story. Number one is he had to get them to commit to do the work. See, nothing gets done by uncommitted people. I like what one person said. You must get involved to have an impact. No one is impressed with the win-loss record of the referee. See, there was a vision for the work. Look back at verse 17 and verse number 18. Then said I unto them, Ye see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates there are, are burned with fire. Come and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. See, Nehemiah had to communicate the importance of what? The wall. You have to be vocal when communicating something of importance that you want people to get be high. I'm going to tell you right now. Vacation Bible School and Victory Kids over here on Wednesday nights are two of the most important ministries that we have in the church. They're wonderful ministries. Vacation Bible School is one week a year. And I know that it's hard, it's difficult. And after that week, you're ready just to just come home on that Friday night and you're ready just to lay your arms out and just flop down on the bed and say, Lord, thankful it's over. Thank you, Jesus. I've made it through. Hey, I've felt like that before. I have. But it's such an important week. Victory Kids starts back up this Wednesday night. Goes all the way through the month of May. And as those little kids walk in the door, and they see us smiling, and we see those smiling faces as well. Man, it is such a joy to serve the Lord by loving on them. It's such a joy. It's such a joy to do that. And we must communicate that to know that it is an important task. Hey, we need some positions that need to be filled. You're thinking, well, hey, I'm not doing anything right now. We'd love for you to get involved. We would. We'd love for you to serve, whether it be over there just a referee between two kids that we need to separate. Hey, that's okay. We can get you as a referee. All right. Hey, maybe you just want to ride the bus or van and help pick up the kids. Hey, that's okay. Maybe you want to be in there just flipping the pancake or doing whatever on Wednesday nights to help prepare the food. Hey, that's okay. We need you. Or maybe you say, I'd like to help a teacher. We need you. And here, Nehemiah communicated the importance of the wall. He needed to say it. Because he wanted them to believe in it. All right. Now, why was the wall important? Well, walls are important. When you think about war, a wall is important because you need to have a way to separate yourself from the evil and the enemies. And with them being at a reproach here, with them having no wall, they were vulnerable for any type of an attack. But what do walls speak to us on an individual basis? There are over 250 references to walls in the Bible. Walls speak of security. Walls protect us. How many of you would like to have a house built and all you had was just a foundation and you had a little umbrella over you with no walls? How safe would you feel at night going to bed? I don't know about you. But I would have to be sleeping if I didn't have no walls. I'd like to have me a weapon of some kind to my side, especially the world we live in today. You would not feel safe if you didn't have walls. But also, walls speak of separation. Walls divide. A wall down and a line makes a border. See, walls say to its occupants, 
You're safe inside. But also walls speak to the intruder saying, you're not welcome. And if you try to get in, we will fight. And this is what happened here in biblical times. But also, walls are important for us spiritually. And why is that? It's because God wants His people to remain separate from this old wicked world. Doctrinal walls. Some people say, oh, why can't we just all get together? All the churches that call themselves a church. Why can't we just have a big universal church and just worship? You know why that is? It's because all of us don't see eye to eye and there's some that believe in things that are not scriptural. And you can't worship with those who believe ungodly things. But the Bible tells us also of walls of moral purity. We're to keep that wall about us because if not, if that wall crumbles, if that wall just goes away, you have no defense of what this world brings to you and throws at you trying to tear you down. But walls also speak of strength. A city's wall was a testimony of its strength. God told Jeremiah, Behold, I have made thee this day a defense city and an iron pillar and brazen walls against the whole land. See, you will only be as strong as a Christian as the walls you have established around you in your spiritual life. So first, he had to share his vision. What are we doing? Why is it important? But then also, they had to volunteer for the work. Verse 18 of chapter 2. And they said, let us rise up, rise up and build. Nehemiah can encourage them all day long. But they were the only ones that could rise up and get to work. I'm sure he probably wanted to pull them up. He thought, maybe there's some I'm going to have to get by their shirts and actually get them up on their feet physically. All right. But no, here he said, we find out, let us rise up and build. They saw the need, they took it to heart, and they committed themselves to the work. And they were convinced, as it says here in verse number 18, that it wasn't some little just pity, little small job, but it was a good work. A good work that God had called them to do. See, the Lord Jesus does not force His yoke upon us. He simply says this in Matthew eleven twenty nine: 29. Take my yoke upon you. You've got to take it up. You've got to be willing. You've got to be ready. But not only that, they were volunteering for the work, but they were venturing to the work. Chapter 4, verse number 6 says, So built we the wall for the people out of mind to work. They got to it. They got busy. Now, I know some people. I've been guilty of this myself too, or maybe you have, or you know someone that's like this. Oh, they talk the good talk. And they'll say, I'm going to build this outside, this shed. Or oh, I'm going to build me a garage. I'm going to get to work on rebuilding this engine for whatever it might be. A year goes by, two years, three years, four years, five years. Still nothing is done. You ever met someone like that before? Maybe that's you, I don't know. But if you ever had something like that, where you wanted to do something, you talked about it a lot. I'm telling you, you can talk something to death, but until action and it is put into gear, nothing's going to happen. Okay? And here we see that they got busy. They started working. See, commitment always leads to commencement. A commitment that does not lead to commencement is worthless. So here, the first part of the recipe for success is he had to convince them and he had to preach to them the importance of being committed. Number two, 
he had to also preach to them, tell them of the importance of coordination. And this all literally fell back on Nehemiah. Now as we read here in the passage of Scripture, chapter number 3, I'm not going to read all those verses to you, but we find out that there was wall-to-wall workers, an unbroken chain of workers that were putting their best foot forward of trying to get this done. 38 individual workers are named. 42 different groups are identified in this passage of Scripture. You know what made it work? It was a united effort. A united effort. Every worker adjoined his work with his neighbors. These phrases repeated throughout the chapter. And next to him, next unto them, after him, after them. But what was important on Nehemiah's part? Nehemiah had to organize them. Because if you don't have organization, you have confusion, you have chaos, and every worker knew what portion of the wall was his responsibility to work on. Now this doesn't happen just by choice, it happens by job descriptions. Now remember, think about this, if you go to the dealership and you're getting your car maintenance, what about if all the people at the same time tried to work on the same tire? Well, there'd be chaos. They'd be trying to pull the tire. The guy hadn't even got the lug nuts off yet. They'd be all confused, all upset, because they're all trying to do the same thing at the same time. No, when you go, there's different people that are qualified to do different things on a vehicle. And like we find here in the passage of Scripture, there were job descriptions of where they were to serve along the wall as it was being built. See, we must see how each of our ministries adjoins with the whole. Vacation Bible School. We have Victory Kids on Wednesday nights. We have our adult Bible studies. We have our worship. We have our sermons on Sunday mornings. We have the different types of outreach that we have. We have missions. And all of these different ministries, yes, have different people that are working within them, but they all adjourn together. And they work together for the great of furthering the gospel of Jesus Christ. But see, there was a division of labor, simple and practical. It was productive. One of the basic tenets of leadership is simplicity. Boy, I like that word. You ever tear open something and you get those directions? And I think to myself, I like to jump ahead and I'm thinking, how in the world am I going to get this thing together? And I don't like reading through because they tell you all these little parts. And then you start counting them and you're one Missing and you're like, oh no, because that one thing's probably going to hold the whole piece together. But it's missing. But the thing is, I like simplicity. And the capacity to cut a big task down by a size we can handle. Nehemiah divided the work of the wall into smaller sections separated by ten gates. So everybody had their responsibility within the gate. Church I used to be at, they used to hold up a sign sometimes if you got a little lengthy during a devotion or they'd sometimes kid with the pastor. They'd hold up a little sign that says KISS. K-I-S-S and each one of those letters reminded something and they would say, keep it short, silly. (laughs) Please don't hold that up on Sunday for me. Keep it short. But Nehemiah was practical in assigning work. Each worker worked near their own house. What would this do? It'd make it easier for them to get there, to finish the job, and get home to their family. There was a lot of practical in this. Any work for God must begin at our home. If it doesn't work at home, it won't work anywhere else. But then not only do we see the division of labor, but the description of labor. Three words describe their labor. Build seven times. The work of the church is about building. It's about building new opportunities to serve. 
Number two, we see here in chapter 3, verse number 8, fortified, the wall was still standing at some positions in some places, but it needed strengthening. Oftentimes in a church, you'll find that in a ministry where it's been going for so long, but oftentimes it needs some strengthening, some support to make it better so it can serve more in the family and outside the walls too. But the word repaired also is used 30 times. Fixing what is broken. See, if a ministry is broken, it's not effective. We've got to step back. We've got to reevaluate. Oftentimes in football, when you go three downs and out, we found this over this weekend, you punt on fourth down. Now, if you got maybe one or two yards, you might try for it, maybe. If you got longer than that, you're not going to go for it. You're going to step back, punt, reevaluate, and try your best the next series that you have the possession. And oftentimes, a ministry ain't in that. You just step back, reevaluate, and see if maybe there's some things that need improvement. Well, this is what Nehemiah called them to do. But then thirdly, another recipe for success is cooperation. Success depends on the cooperation of its workers. So everyone can do something. A variety of people from all walks of life working together. Look at this that we find here in chapter 3 of listening. We see priests that were working. Spiritual leaders set the example. Number two, goldsmiths. There were jewelers that were working. Apothecaries. This was more than likely a pharmacist that was working. Shalom's daughters, they worked in the nursery. Well, there was kids that had to be here, so someone had to tend to the children while people were working. Men of the plain, verse 22, merchants, businessmen that got involved to help in this effort. And then also the Nathenums, the temple servants. See, in the body of Christ, people have a diversity of talents. Each one of us are different in the talents we have, but everyone has a ministry. It takes all of God's people working together to get the task done. See, 1 Corinthians 3, 9 tells us we are laborers together with God. All may not be able to do the same work. The daughters of Shalom could not lift heavy things for projects. But they could do something. They could take care of the kids. The priests and merchants may not be expert in laying bricks, but they did something. They got involved. We we'll also know here that some do more work than others. We find this out. It isn't enough to say I'm done as much as I so-and-so has. We must do as much as we can as long as we can. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 5.47, What do ye more than others? Some work harder than others. Six times we find workers doing another piece. They didn't just do the bare minimum to get by. They looked for another piece to stop work or start working on. They weren't lazy. They weren't just ready to sit down after the job was done. And you know why that is? It's because they believe in getting toward the end result of having this wall rebuilt. Baruch worked earnestly in chapter 3, verse number 20. Look at that there. And out of him, Baruch, the son of Zabai, earnestly repaired the other piece from the turning of the wall unto the door of the house of Elisheb, the high priest. Now, the Hebrew word translated earnestly means to be hot. To be hot. And what does this mean for us when we talk about Baruch? Is that Baruch sweated as he labored on the walls because he had worked hard enough to get hot. I think it's time we need to get hot in our work for God. It's time for us to sweat. It's time for us to work and roll up our 
sleeve. Sometimes we think, I'm just going to do the bare minimum. Just the bare minimum. And you know, for some church members that go and attend church, the bare minimum is just saying, I've come, I'm here, that's the bare minimum. But that, in all reality, is literally, I'm thankful, we're pastors are thankful that people come and see. Yes, that's wonderful, but there's more to do than just sitting in a pew. There's more to do than just those things that we think are enough. And that's what we see here from Baruch. He earnestly, he was sweating. And you know why? It's because just like I told you, he believed in getting to the end result of seeing the wall rebuilt. That's why he worked earnestly. But number four is a commendation. Workers need to know how much they are what? Appreciated. You know, it goes a long way. For someone to come up to you and say, I'm thankful for what you do. Especially if you've labored, you've worked hard. That means so much. You could be at the point of saying, I'm ready to throw my hands up. But then someone comes and literally just says to you, thank you. That goes a long way. I'm appreciative for what you have done. See, workers like to know their leaders take a personal interest in them. Nehemiah, this is important here as we look at this, he knew their names. They didn't just have a badge number. You know, oftentimes at work you go through, your boss may not even know your name if you've got a lot of employees that are there. They may call you badge so-and-so or homophobia you come over here I don't know if that's a word or not but hey get over here I don't know your name but you get over here and do this job but Nehemiah knew their names where they worked where he placed them and what they had accomplished but not only that he knew their family you know, that's why I'm just going to a personal level here and some people like to laugh and kid around. I, I like to call people on their birthdays. I've always been like that. And I was called Justin yesterday. and He said, I'm answering this thing, man. I don't want to hear you sing no more, okay? <laughs> but I just call and if you don't answer, I'm going to sing happy birthday to you. And if I miss you, if something's going on, I promise you I will call you and I will sing or I'll do whatever. But I do that. And it's because it's hard for me to think about everybody on the same day. But I just want you to know on that day, your pastor thought about you. And I just want to wish that you have a great birthday. And that means a lot to people. I found out years ago that just letting people know those simple things, like go a long way. But here, Nehemiah knew a lot about their families, where they were. He took a personal interest in them. And you know why that was so important? Because in order for them to do what he had called them to do, they needed to know what he cared. And that's important, okay? And hey, I care about what you do. I care about this church and it moving forward. I care about Victory Kids. I know I'm not able to be over there because we got this over here, but I come over and I appreciate everything that everyone does because it is so vital for these kids to see you put forward your best foot every time you're with them. Love them. Care about them. And this is what happened with Nehemiah. He commended the workers. But not only that, listen to this. One minute management principles. People who feel good about themselves produce good results. People who produce good results feel good about themselves. That's important. So not only was the success because of a, com, com, a commendation of commending them, but also there was a recipe for success because of the completion. The Bible tells us they kept their eyes on the goal until the job was done. They built it, the wall. Now it doesn't say that we know historically later on Israel always had their problems. Jerusalem had its issues. But they kept their eyes on the goal until the job was done. Finish the job. 
don't quit. That's what coaches tell their football players. There's been many of games where a team has went into halftime. I'll never forget, I think it was 1992, where the Buffalo Bills trailed the Houston Oilers at halftime in one of the greatest NFL comebacks of all time. The Buffalo Bills came back from a deficit and won 41-38 to after being down by the largest margin ever at halftime. How did they do it? Marv Levy, the head coach, walked into halftime. Bruce Smith, Jim Kelly, Thurman Thomas, all those players during that time, they decided that they weren't going to quit. And because they didn't quit, they won and they went and they eventually went to the Super Bowl. But the thing is, sometimes with jobs, it seems like it's hard. They want to just throw in a towel. There's been some jobs and some things that I've tried to work on before, like things with Titus putting together, and I get so frustrated, I'm just like, I'm just giving up on this thing. Like I mentioned earlier, but I have to walk away, think about it, come back with a rest, like a fresh set of thoughts and just a fresh just attitude towards it, and then I eventually get it done. But the thing is, You've got to finish the job. Don't quit. And you know why it's so important for us to think like that as Christians? It's because when Jesus went to the cross, it would have been so easy for Him just to say, Father, it's too much. Way too much. I don't think I can do it. I don't think I can handle this anymore. But no, the Bible tells us He went all the way even until death on the cross for you and for me. And because of that, we should give our best. We should do what we can. But that takes, as a church, having everyone collectively together working toward the common goal. Now the names of the first and last workers that were mentioned in chapter number 3 are actually suggestive of Jesus. Have you actually read that and thought about that before? The Alpha and the Omega of His spiritual work, the High Priest... Elishib is God the Restorer, that name. And then in verse 31 we see Malchiah, and his God is King, and between the rising of the high priest and the coming of the king, the work was done. And when Christ ascended to heaven, he began his intercessory work as the great high priest, and one day he will come as King. And then, in the meantime, we know this. Like the old song says, we'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work. It's an old song, but what great truth. Give it your best. Work. But it takes more than just one or two individuals. Nehemiah need the whole group working to make this wall what it needed to be. And I pray this morning, if you're not serving, we'd like for you to. Maybe there's a spot that you've been thinking about. We'd love for you to take that position. Come help out. Even if it's just the smallest of areas where you'd like to get involved, we'd love for you to come. And what a perfect illustration this is of how Nehemiah got the people to believe in rebuilding the wall. And that was his recipe for success. Amen. Let's stand together this morning. We'll pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for this privilege to be here today. We thank you for your word. I thank you that I could be your messenger today, once again, Father, to rightly divide the word of truth. I pray this morning if someone needs to come for whatever it might be, today maybe someone realizes they're lost and they're in need of a Savior. I pray that they would come. We'd have the, love to have the opportunity to share with them about how they can have a personal relationship with Jesus. Maybe today someone has felt upon their heart, a tug upon their heart of knowing that they need to take that step forward and, and serve in some capacity. Uh, they've been thinking about it, praying about it. Oh, Father, we'd love for them to do that and let them or, or share how they'd like to serve. Or, Father, today maybe someone just needs to come pray for something upon their heart that they've walked in here with today. 
They're heavy laden. They're, they're upset. They've been through a lot. And I know that as we come to pray, if we've got those things upon our heart, just having that person kneel down and with a hand upon a shoulder, just praying for them goes a long ways. Father, we don't need to know what they're going through, but we do need to pray for them and let them know that they're loved. We love you and we thank you for this time once again. And we pray that if anyone needs to come, they will. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Softly and tenderly Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. Be on the portal, please waiting and watching, watching. to be here this morning. Hopefully this was an encouragement to you and a challenge. If you've been considering and thinking about serving in some way, we'd love for you to get involved. Uh, at this time, uh, while we're still standing here, this will take just, a, it's going to be very brief. Uh, I'd like to call uh, Victory Baptist Church to order of business just for a few moments here. And we are going to be bringing up uh, Mark and Naomi Byers to be missionaries that we are going to support. Remember, they are going to be going to Germany. They're still searching and wanting to come up with all the necessary funds. They're prayerfully hoping to be gone in the spring to go ahead and start serving. But I've known Mark for some time, and uh, I just know his heart. And I know that they will be a wonderful asset for us to have and to support. So... Um, with that being said, do we have a motion to accept them as our missionaries? Motion? Do we have a second? Um, all in favor, let it be known by just saying amen. 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 Well, great. Um, and uh, we'll just uh, make a motion. Do we have a motion to adjourn this business meeting as well? Make a motion. Second? All right. All in favor. Everybody's already standing, so we are good. So we're thankful to have... Uh, Mark and Naomi will be contacting them, letting them know about us supporting them as missionaries and looking forward to how God is going to use them. Uh, also, I won't be standing here at the back to uh, say hello and as you leave today. Uh, we're going to be having a short meeting up here about uh, Church in the Park next Sunday night. And I would ask you if you are going to be participating and wanting to help with that next Sunday, please just come up um, here I, no matter which side, just, let's just make us a good couple rolls here of people and uh, we'll go over what needs to be done, make for certain that we get all of this taken care of so we can be well prepared for next week for a wonderful opportunity for us to minister in the community. Okay? All right, let's go ahead and let's pray. Keep in mind, uh, please to stick around after the service. Let's go ahead and pray and dismiss in a word of prayer. And Pete, would you please pray for us? <laughs> 